Pure carbon forms weak electrostatic bonds with multiple chemicals. It does not have a polar surface, but it gets induced polarity by polar molecules that are close by, leading to what are called London dispersion force bonds. If the geometry of a carbon surface feature is correct, then a specific molecule can stick to the carbon by this means. Activated carbon or activated charcoal has gone through an industrial chemical or physical process to increase its total surface area. Unactivated charcoal has a typical surface area of 1 to 2 meters squared per gram, whereas activated charcoal can be between 500 and 3000 meters squared per gram. This is done by creating micropores in the surface. The size of these varies from 2 to over 50 nanometers. The distribution of pore sizes determines what kinds of molecules the carbon is best at sticking to or adsorbing with a D. Water, ethanol and HEDSI chemicals like acetone and methanol are all pretty small, with molecular diameters between a quarter and two thirds of a nanometer. Activated carbon with a suitable pore size does not therefore have much discrimination between them. Activated charcoal with a higher pore size has a preference for larger molecules and this is favourable for removing tastes and smells from water or air, which is why most general purpose carbon filtration systems commercially available use that kind of pore size. Those carbons are more sticky for larger molecules which will displace smaller molecules. That's not particularly relevant to us because azeotropic distillation already gives us an effective way of removing larger molecules from spirit. The upshot for moonshine is that carbon filtration does work, but as with so many comparable systems, it's at its least effective when we most want it. The individual chemicals responsible for particular tastes are often not known, so the precise chemistry of the interaction is less relevant than the observed effect of carbon filtration on the taste. Taste is a direct assessment of the quality we're trying to enhance, rather than a surrogate assessment such as using gas chromatography, but unfortunately taste is variable between individuals and is quite subjective. To do taste assessment properly is expensive because it requires panels of human tasters employed to work under controlled conditions. I am primarily relying on my own sense of taste with the occasional consultation of friends and family and that means that my conclusions about what measures to take to make the best vodka may not apply to you but at least the controllable parameters and process of choosing them will be the same. Several carbon systems are available commercially. One of the most widely sold is the Brita carbon water filtering system that uses a carbon filter cartridge and a two-chamber gravity system for passing liquid through the filter. There are many other similar water filtration systems that use replaceable cartridges. Another option is a filtration system designed for use with vodka. Still Spirits, the same company that makes the T500 Still, make two such systems. The EZ costs about $90 for the equipment and about $1 per litre of 50% spirit filtered for the carbon. So that's about $2 per litre of azeotropic mix. The Filter Pro system costs about $200 for the equipment and about $1.50 per litre of 50% filtered or $3 per 8 litre of azeotrope for the carbon. It uses a ratio of 500 grams of carbon per 8 litres of 50% spirit filtered over 8 hours. That is a far higher ratio of carbon to liquid and a far slower filtration rate than you find with water filtering systems like the Brita. It does accord with my experience that carbon filtration in this application is relatively ineffective, so the amount of it required is much increased compared to other applications. I've used the still spirits ratios of time, volume and carbon in a homemade system and it does work, but the amount of carbon required means that it's quite a high added cost per litre of azeotropic alcohol. It cost me about $2.50 US to produce one litre of azeotropic alcohol in sugar and yeast. The energy cost of distillation will add about 10% to that. If carbon filtration adds another 2 to $3, it approximately doubles the cost. Commercial operations use regeneration to restore the absorptive capacity of the carbon by heating it to several hundred degrees centigrade in a reducing environment and flushing it with a suitable non-oxidizing gas. This is rarely feasible for home distillers for whom it is effectively a single-use item, making it expensive. I have tried the Brita jug system. 
One complaint I have about it is that the jug is a bad pourer, which is a particular irritation when distilling azeotropic spirits because spillages are lost. I tried a homemade system with a chamber and bits of pipe filled with loose carbon, comparable to the Still Spirits Filter Pro, and I tried carbon tea bags or sachets. These are perforated fibre bags with carbon inside. Rather than passing the liquid through them, you place them in the jar containing the liquid and they adsorb chemicals over time. All of these methods had a basically similar end result, but differing degrees of complexity in getting there. I did not test them all under exactly comparable conditions. I used the tea bags and homemade carbon chamber for the heart's cut of a batch distillation using an isothermal deflagmator rather than continuous distillation with a controllable column top temperature. The result was that the spirit I used to test the tea bag method and the homemade chamber was slightly more headsy to begin with than the other tests, and that made the difference the carbon made a little more obvious. But the end results from all these experiments were fairly similar. I left two 190 gram tea bags in a jar of 5 litres of azeotropic alcohol for two days, and the homemade chamber was filled with 5 litres of azeotropic spirit and drained through the half kilogram of carbon in about six hours. With the Brita system, I started with better spirits from continuous distillation with a column top temperature of 70 degrees, and I couldn't tell the difference after one pass through the filter, so I repeated passes. I thought there possibly was a difference after about the fourth pass and was confident there was a difference after the tenth pass. That was pretty tedious. There is one final oddity about carbon filtration though which I have only tested with the Brita system. After applying ozone to the liquor it improves considerably and there seems to be a further significant improvement with a single pass through a Brita filter after ozone exposure. I mentioned the idea of incidental tasting in my video on ozone and it is of interest that this difference only showed up in incidental tasting, presumably because I wasn't really focusing on those kind of tastes and just noticed they happened to be there. Maybe this is a quirk of my unreliable sense of taste, but if it is also your experience, it suggests that the ozone process is removing some flavours by oxidation, but the oxidised chemicals impart other flavours that are particularly sensitive to removal by carbon. If that is the case, it suggests that Hans van Leeuwen of ozone vodka fame, who I discussed in my previous video, has hit on a winning formula of ozone exposure followed by carbon filtration. I understand that differing the parameters of fermentation have an effect on the product, but I don't have experience of that. All of these experiments have been done using a solution of 24 kilograms of granulated cane sugar per 100 litres of mixture and Alcotec Vodka Star yeast, fermented at 25 degrees centigrade for two weeks and then left to clear before distilling. I've made videos on four techniques for improving vodka, those being multiple distillation, control of column top temperature, ozone and carbon. Of these, the most effective are ozone and column top temperature control. Ozone is the cheapest and easiest to use with an ordinary still because my column top temperature control system requires a specially designed column. Carbon alone is limited in its effectiveness and it is quite expensive, but carbon after ozone works well. Multiple distillation is effective, but it's slow, reduces yield and has a high energy cost. My current balance between cost, time and quality of product is single azeotropic distillation with a 70 degree column top temperature followed by ozone bubbling for two hours followed by a single pass Brita carbon filtration. The vagaries of taste assessment mean that this formula may not work for you. But I do think it's worth buying an inexpensive carbon system like a Brita jug, a few carbon tea bags or 500 grams of carbon for a homemade system to experiment with.